So the Titans from Warhammer 40k have always had a really special place in my heart. When me and my friends first got into 40k, we were completely overwhelmed. The scale of it was unlike anything we had ever encountered before. Now, like a lot of people, I started with the tabletop game way back in 4th edition. And back then, the largest model me and my friends had ever seen was like a Carnifex, which by today's standards isn't really that big, but to us it was absolutely massive. However, at the game store we played at, we would constantly hear rumors of something far bigger. That there were some mechanical monstrosities out there that dwarfed everything else in the game. Now, we didn't know if this was true or not. But every now and then a blurry picture would surface on the internet, depicting some kind of abomination whose model was the size of a small child. We were dumb kids, we didn't know what Forge World was. And this was the early 2000s, so we weren't used to just googling stuff. Now it wasn't until years later when I started reading the novels that I found out that the titans were real, and that the god engines were potentially the most badass thing in the entire universe. But what exactly is a titan? Where do they come from and how are they made? Is it true that they're actually sentient and most of them have unique personalities? And what's the deal with that Psy Titan that everybody talks about? Is it actually a horrifying monstrosity or are the rumors kind of overblown? Spoiler alert, it's absolutely horrifying. We're gonna get into that and a whole lot more in this video. But first I'm gonna give a quick shout out to this week's sponsor and believe it or not, they actually fit the subject matter of this video perfectly. And after that, we're gonna dive headfirst into the grim dark. Stay tuned. So the Horus Heresy was possibly the bloodiest civil war mankind has ever seen. Half of the Space Marine Legions broke their sacred oaths and sided with the traitorous war master, Horus Lupercal. This was a war that pitted brother against brother, son against father, and nearly tore the Imperium apart. Now it's not a stretch to say that it's possibly the most important storyline in all of Warhammer. And Horus Heresy Legions lets you take control of a legendary warlord and play through some of the most iconic moments in Warhammer's history. From the burning of Prospero to the infamous Drop Site Massacre, this game is chock full of some awesome features, including tournaments, draft events, intense PvP battles, and even the ability to join a Space Marine Lodge or create your own, and then lead that lodge against thousands of others across the world for some pretty awesome rewards. Victory in special events earns an aspiring Warmaster a lot more than just bragging rights. From brand new exclusive cards to the ability to influence the course of the story, as those who prove themselves worthy can help decide which historic battle the game will cover next. And with the debut of the brand new Titan Death expansion, the long-awaited God Engines have finally joined this epic conflict, as the loyalist and traitor Titan Legions are being introduced to the game as two new playable factions. These monstrosities wield weapons powerful enough to kill entire cities single-handedly, not to mention dominate just about anything that would stand in their way. The forces of the loyalist Titan Legions are available right now, with their chaotic traitor rivals dropping on June 17th. The update also includes a ton of extra content, including over 150 new cards that feature legendary troops, warlords, and tactics, and not to mention the Titan Builder, in which you can craft and customize your very own god engine. The expansion is giving out brand new starter decks to every player regardless of their platform of choice. Well, Steam users will receive an exclusive deck featuring the Loyalist Titans, meaning you can jump into the command throne of a god engine right away. Check out the links in my description to download the game for free and claim your rightful place as the Warmaster today. Thanks again to my friends over at Horus Heresy Legions for sponsoring this video and let's get into the grimdark. The galaxy of the 41st millennium is filled with some pretty massive monstrosities, creatures of incomprehensible size and destructive potential that are chained to the service of alien and demonic armies. Now these things lurk deep in the void of space and prey on the denizens of mankind. But in response, the Imperium has raised soldiers uncountable and legions of war engines to combat the terrors of the galaxy. But of all of humanity's creations, none even come remotely close to inspiring both fear and awe quite like the God Engines. The Titans, as they are known, are the largest and most powerful land-based war engines mankind has ever crafted. They are a terrifying miracle of construction and innovation, absolutely gigantic in scale, and each an ancient and sacred holy relic in their own right. The earth trembles and buckles under the massive footsteps of these enormous bipedal engines of destruction, each a living mountain clad in metric tons of armor and protected even further by shimmering void shields that ripple around them like oil on water, able to withstand the explosive impacts of macro shells that could level cities. And the weaponry that the titans bring to bear is so destructive that it sunders the earth beneath its bombardments. It boils away oceans and turns arid deserts into shimmering plains of glass. 
Each of the god engines is so inconceivably mighty that the members of the Mechanicum see them as living avatars of the Machine God. Simply to be in their presence is to witness such mechanical perfection that for most of mankind, it would be a profoundly religious experience. A single Titan is a mechanical god, an amalgamation of all of mankind's knowledge, great and terrible, distilled into a single perfect machine. Now in their prime, the various Titan legions may have controlled between 200 and 300 of these mechanical monstrosities, a force whose footsteps alone could flatten worlds beneath their inconceivable weight. Yet in the far-flung grim darkness of the 41st millennium, but a handful of these godlike war engines still exist. And to witness a campaign that utilizes such fearsome power is truly a rare sight. Now the myriad of imperial and heretical forces that engage in battle beneath the shadow of a Titan seem like nothing but ants, children playing soldiers under the watchful eye of a living god of war, set loose to topple empires and lay low those who oppose their master's will. And these things are a lot more than just your standard giant engine of death, as each of the god engines is actually somewhat sentient, in that the machine spirits that inhabit them are so vast and powerful that they retain a personality that's actually unique to the engine they inhabit. Some of these desire more than anything to protect their allies, to act as a shield against the darkness, while others are vengeful and spiteful entities, seeking slaughter above all else. They have a desire to stain red the sands of distant worlds with the blood of heretics. The mind and body of a Titan's pilot must be a spectacular example of mankind's potential, as to bring such a monstrous creation to heel is an almost impossible task. They must learn to guide the engine's monstrous wrath into the path of the enemy, whether they be a paragon of virtue and righteousness or a blasphemous heretic. Now, much of the Titan's early history is shrouded in mystery, but it is known that the god engines have served the tech priests of Mars since a shadowy period known as the Age of Pathogenesis, a mysterious time period of which records have either been purged or sealed away, locked forever beneath the surface of Mars, never to be seen again. Long had the Titans stayed dormant, resigned to stand sentinel as the guardians of Mars. However, mankind has an unshakable obsession with spectacular violence, and eventually, the god engines would be roused to battle and conscripted into the Emperor's Great Crusade, mankind's ultimate creations set loose to unleash their wrath against a thousand worlds. And inevitably, as is the nature of man, treachery and betrayal would force even the great Titan orders themselves to take sides in the bloodiest civil war humanity had ever seen. Let's take a deeper look at the Titans, the god engines of mankind. So for clarification, there are actually a lot of different types of Titan. It's not just a single engine of war. They range in size from the all but forgotten rapier class that was said to be smaller than a warhound, all the way up to the colossal battlefield dominating emperor class Titans that some in the community like to jokingly refer to as giant walking cities or battle churches. In fact, in my research, I've found dozens of different subclassifications of Titan. However, they fit into two major categories, Scout and Battle Titans. Scout Titans are smaller and traditionally utilize a lot less armor, and not to mention heavy weapon systems, in favor of being highly mobile. And the larger Battle Titans are pretty slow and clunky, but make up for this with metric tons of city-killing weaponry. And to keep this video simple and not drawn out for a hundred millennia, I'm gonna go over the four major categories of Titan, of which all of the various patterns are pulled from. These include the Warhounds, the Reavers, the Warlords, and the Emperor-class Titans. All right, so going from smallest to biggest, let's start with the Warhounds. And although massive in their own right, the Warhound is the smallest war engine that still retains the classification of Titan. Now due to their smaller size, the various weapon configurations that a Warhound can wield are limited in comparison to the multiple weapon mounting systems of their larger siblings. Now that's not to say that they don't still load up with some truly devastating firepower, as it is said that any weapon that can be mounted on a Battle Titan can also be mounted on a Warhound. However, since the Titan is smaller and doesn't have quite the power supply that a Battle Titan does, when utilizing weapons made for their larger siblings, the effectiveness and efficiency of these weapons is slightly reduced. Scout Titans like the Warhound also have the negative of having less hard points, and these are the places in which weapons can be mounted. So most of the time a Warhound is rolling into battle with just what they can equip on their arms. However, what the Warhound lacks in firepower, they make up for in speed. They have vastly superior maneuverability to Battle Titans and this allows them to flank and hit hard behind enemy lines, while still offering support to infantry in capturing crucial objectives. And this may sound kind of crazy, but just hear me out. 
The Warhounds are actually far more terrifying to enemy titans than even the largest of Emperor class god engine. You see, their maneuverability allows them to run circles around the big boys, whose movements are clumsy and awkward compared to that of the Warhound. They dart across the field, hunched and loping like a feral predator who has caught the scent of blood. This allows them to get into more favorable positions where they have line of sight on the vulnerable parts of their prey. The pilots of a Warhound are trained specifically in exploiting these weaknesses, where if you have two Emperor class Titans attacking each other, it's like, well, neither one of us is very fast and we're too large to hide behind cover. Not like that would do any good against a quake cannon or a volcano cannon, so let's just blast the shit out of each other until one of us falls over. This makes the Warhound perfect Titan killers. And to be fair, a single Warhound may not quite have the firepower to take down such large prey by itself, but the Warhounds often hunt in packs. And this is known as a hunter detachment, and it's something that all Titan pilots fear. Now, going up a little bit further from the Scout Titans, you have what are known as Battle Titans, and the Reaver is the smallest variant that fits in this category. Although less maneuverable than a Warhound, it is said that a Reaver can sustain about twice as much damage before being crippled. Not to mention the fact that since they're a Battle Titan, a Reaver can take far more devastating weaponry without making sacrifices. And possibly the most peculiar thing about this type of Titan specifically is that its power core isn't actually located in its core. Instead, it's actually placed on the back of their carapace. This means that they can take a lot more frontal damage before the core is inevitably punctured. And because of their design, Reavers are often placed on the front lines. As long as they keep the enemy in front of them, they're in a really good position to lay down as much punishment as humanly possible. The Reavers are ideally suited for open battlefields, but when moving into a city or a canyon where enemy fire can come from any direction, the Reavers suddenly find themselves at a significant disadvantage. And these guys stand around 25 meters tall on average and are incredibly flexible with their weapon systems, being able to utilize many different loadouts depending on the situation. However, they most commonly take multiple rocket launchers on their carapace mounting. Okay, moving up to something a little bigger, let's talk about the Warlords. So a Warlord class Titan is the most common pattern of Battle Titan in use in the 41st millennium. And many of the Forge Worlds that create them actually have their own unique patterns, meaning that Warlords from different worlds all have something unique about them that sets them apart from their brothers. And these guys are pretty enormous and stand around 33 meters in height on average. Now I will point out that there's a little inconsistency here because if you're looking at the super early lore, the Warlords were stated as being well over 200 meters tall. This is why a lot of the artwork that you'll see of them depicts them as truly massive. I think it's a safe bet to go with the newer lore that states them at being a little bit smaller. And although they may not be as truly ridiculously sized as the early lore states, 33 meters is nothing to scoff at. That's still massive. And because of their huge size, unfortunately their maneuverability does suffer quite a bit. Something that big isn't gonna be diving for cover anytime soon. So to counteract this, the Warlords have been designed to weather enormous amounts of firepower rather than avoid it. Not only is a Warlord covered in thick armor plating, but it utilizes even more void shielding than the smaller Titans. And in a lot of instances, this void shielding covers their legs to protect them from cocky infantry that would seek to close in out of sight from the behemoth and set melter charges on it. This design creates an almost impenetrable shielding, allowing the Warlord to shrug off all but the most devastating of weaponry. And don't worry, we're gonna get into some of those Titan-killing guns real soon. Now the crew of a Warlord Titan will often consist of its pilot, known as a Princep, and a pair of individuals known as Mortarati. The Princeps ultimately has control over every portion of the Titan, but there's an enormous amount of stuff to keep track of, so these officers alleviate some of that burden, often manning the gun arms. The crew can consist of many specialists, such as engineers or steersmen, and will almost always have at least a handful of tech priests to assist in repairs and recite the sacred litanies of the machine god. These litanies and prayers keep the various machine spirits found throughout the Titan appeased, and in good working order. So yes, when the Titan takes a heavy hit that damages something critical, the tech priests do in fact send thoughts and prayers to keep it operational. But here's the thing, it actually kinda works. And we'll get into the lore of machine spirits when I do an Adeptus Mechanicus deep dive. For all intents and purposes, a Warlord Titan is a living god, a massive fortress of death and destruction, capable of wielding the most powerful of Titan weaponry. And even though there is one more Titan to go that is far larger than these things, I would contest that despite it not being the biggest, 
the Warlord is potentially the most effective and deadly. Okay, let's talk about the absolute largest titans. So the colossal god engines known as Emperor class titans are like a walking fortress. And these things are bristling with an almost irresponsible amount of firepower. These behemoths come in two known patterns, the Imperator and the Warmonger class titan. And I know there's some debate in the comments on how to pronounce Imperator, but that's how it's pronounced in the Warhammer official audiobook, so that's the pronunciation I'm going with. Now, the Imperator operates as an assault platform designed to bring the fighting to the enemy, whereas the latter offers long-range fire support through its multitude of advanced weapon and targeting systems. Now, even during the days of the Horus Heresy, the Emperor-class titans were incredibly rare, now more so than ever, as it takes hundreds of years to complete the construction of a single one, making each one an irreplaceable relic. Now, I'm guessing the first thing that you notice about these guys is their massive cathedrals mounted on top of them. These things serve as a temple for the Titan's crew in which to give praise to the Omnissiah during battle, as well as a fortified position for crew members and generals. And the cathedral itself is not just for decoration, as it's also covered in a ton of different weapons platforms in which to assist their titanic host in battle. And just like their smaller cousins, the Warlord Titans, their true size has varied over the years, early lore putting them so tall that their heads were up in the clouds. But nowadays they're given a more reasonable estimate of being around 55 meters, which is around 188 feet or freedom units for my fellow American listeners. There were actually early rumors of an Emperor class Titan that was so large that it could be seen from orbit. However, information on such a creation has been lost to time, so whether or not it even existed is still a mystery. The only thing that rivals the Emperor class Titans in battlefield dominance and weapon superiority are the capital ships employed by the Imperial Navy. But then again, ships like that are often armed with weapons so powerful that they can initiate exterminatus and can be upwards of 14 kilometers in length. So it's not really a fair comparison. Also like that of the Warlord Titans, a Princept alone is not enough to helm such a massive behemoth, and thus the Emperor class Titans utilize a similar crew. The most common use of an Emperor class Titan is to serve as a mobile battle station. Prominent generals, the Imperial Grand Master of the Titan Legion itself, or other important authority figures can issue orders across the battlefield from the safety of a Titan. These things will often also be used as a resupply point or a carrier of battlefield reinforcements, serving as a tactical reinforcement point for the Astra Militarum or Skitari units. And before we move on, there's something I kind of want to clear up. When multiple Titans are deployed into battle, they function primarily as a team. You will have Titans that are technically more powerful, like it's difficult to say that a Warhound is the equivalent to an Emperor class engine. But when it comes to the armaments and weapon systems of a Titan, everything is always a compromise. To gain longer range, you have to sacrifice firepower. To take heavier armor, you're going to sacrifice mobility. And if you deploy an Emperor class, it's not going to be able to hide and will be a constant target that needs a lot of support. Titans are equipped only with what is necessary to accomplish their task and to be utilized as efficiently as possible. The decision on how the God Engines will be deployed and which role each will fulfill is a very important decision, as making a mistake could mean the loss of an irreplaceable machine that is thousands of years old. So now that you know about the most common types of titans, let's talk about how they're made. But fair warning, there's really not a lot of information on this. You see, most of the information on how the titans are produced has been kept hidden, so we really don't know too much about the process. We do know a couple of important things though. The first is that unlike with most of the incredibly advanced technology of the Imperium, the Titans do not require a fully intact STC to produce. Now, if you don't know what an STC is, they're basically like the holy blueprints for every super cool thing mankind uses. STC stands for Standard Template Construct. And to call these things a set of blueprints is accurate, but it's kind of missing the forest for the trees. You see, they are an incredibly advanced AI system that can not only store enormous amounts of data, including the blueprints for particular machines, but they are even capable of innovating upon them. The STCs were created during the Dark Age of Technology, and unfortunately, the vast majority of them have either been lost or destroyed. This is to say that the Imperium has forgotten the vast majority of humanity's accumulated knowledge. And whenever a new one is found, it's a really big deal. The Mechanicum will go to any length to acquire a new STC, their acquisition being their number one priority. Now, that all being said, there was one known Titan that differed from this, and that was the Castigator. It was a Titan that was much larger than any other that have ever existed. And by all accounts, there was only one of these things ever made. 
it was produced by one of these STCs and was actually controlled by an AI. Now, the castigator was completely self-aware and said that it was the original Titan, that all other Titans were just crude imitations of its perfection. The castigator would end up making a pact with the Black Legion and would allow itself to become possessed by demons. It was inevitably destroyed by the Grey Knights along with the STC used to create it, as this blasphemous machine could not be allowed to live. Now, technically speaking, the Forge Worlds that exist in the 41st millennium are more than capable of creating more god engines. However, there's a slight problem. Just because they don't rely on an STC doesn't mean that they still retain the entire sum of knowledge on how to build them. A lot of it is basically guesswork. Additionally, the amount of supplies needed to produce an Emperor Class Titan, for example, is astronomical. So sometimes even if they would like to build more, it's just not practical. Okay. So now that we know a bit more about what the Titans are, let's talk about their pilots. Now the pilot of a Titan is what is known as a princep, and the pilots will actually be hardwired into the machine itself and have to wrestle its machine spirit into submission. The particularly blasphemous pilots of a Chaos Titan may end up breaking and torturing the machine spirit until it submits to them, whereas the pilots of the Imperial Titans will end up forming a more mutual relationship. Now the Titans are similar to their smaller cousins, the Imperial Knights, in that they both only have a single pilot. The esteemed individuals that would become the pilot of their own god engine are said to be people of impossible worth, possessing minds and bodies far superior to that of their peers. Such pilots have demonstrated unbreakable willpower and unquestioning loyalty. Now it is said that the individuals that meet this criteria are less than one in 10 million, and because of their rarity and immeasurable value, their allies will go to any length to recover them if they go missing in action. When entering the Titan, a princep will be plugged into the god engine through a series of implants and haptic receptors grafted all over their body and fused to their spine. This allows them to fully interface with the Titan, the steel surface of the god engine's form feeling like the pilot's own skin. This means that each devastating blow that the Titan suffers is felt by the pilot. The mind of the princep and the god engine are merged through a mind impulse unit, a complicated neuro input device that allows the two entities to merge body, mind, and soul. There's actually a really interesting scene in the novel Mechanicus, where a pilot is explaining what it's like to try to disconnect from his Titan. He says that connecting and reconnecting is always painful, as if the god engine resented the time spent apart. Each time he would attempt to reconnect, he would once again have to wrestle its defiant spirit into submission. And when the mission was over, and it came time for him to disconnect once again, the machine wouldn't let him go. It would trigger various painful symptoms, such as splitting headaches, aching bones, and an overwhelming mental fog that would last for some time. It's as if the war engine refused to be shackled, wanting to spread and stretch its mighty limbs on the field of battle as often as possible. And this is a feeling that is not mutually held by the god engine, as the pilot itself can become hopelessly addicted to helming their titan. After feeling the earth quake beneath your feet and viewing the battlefield from 30 to 50 meters up in the air, an individual begins to feel like a god. You've never experienced freedom until you become a massive engine of death and are set loose on the battlefield. And every moment they spend outside of their Titan, for lack of better words, is painfully dull. Meaning that in at least a psychological sense, it's not uncommon for a pilot and a Titan to form a mutual codependency. Both of the individuals leaving their imprint on one another the personality of the Titan beginning to blend with that of their master and vice versa. And during the time they are connected, they both learn from each other. And although this sounds kind of cute, the machine spirit of a Titan is massively more powerful than even the mind of the most gifted of pilots. And with the constant linking and relinking, the Titan's spirit pushes the mind of the pilot further and further. And a form of insanity begins to develop in the pilot, the willpower of the Titans slowly beginning to overpower them. The descent into madness for the pilot is an accepted, inevitable reality of melding minds with such a powerful entity. The life of a Titan pilot is a difficult one. At first, they are able to disconnect and resume their duties outside of piloting their god engine, but over time, it takes a toll on their body and mind, and eventually, in order to continue piloting, they will have to be sealed inside a float tank of embryonic fluid. This represents a much more permanent attachment to their Titan, as once sealed inside such a vessel, the only way to leave it is death. Now being entombed in a giant float tank is definitely pretty grim. However, it does come with a lot of benefits, as princeps that have undergone such a procedure end up having a much better bond with the machine spirit of their god engine, and inevitably have a lot more control over it. Such a sacrifice is often deemed as essential for piloting particularly combative Titan machine spirits.
Now that doesn't change the fact that for most pilots, the idea that they will one day meet such a fate is a gloomy and distressing thought that is often pushed to the back of their mind. All right, let's talk about probably the most fun thing when it comes to Titans, and that's their weapons. Now, as one may expect from an enormous killing machine, the Titans are equipped with a wide array of ludicrously devastating firepower. Like, just listen to the names of some of these things. The Volcano Cannon, the Vulcan Mega Bolter, the Vortex Missile Launcher, and the Quake Cannon. And needless to say, there's a lot more than just those four weapons. But like I've said before, I'm gonna try to keep this video relatively short, so we're not gonna go over every single one of them. So let's start with an example of a Titan level anti-infantry weapon. And although it's technically anti-infantry, I don't think that term is 100% accurate because if it's used against just run of the mill soldiers, it's massively overkill. So the first weapon I wanna talk about is called the Vulcan Mega Bolter. And it's an immense hydraulically driven five barrel rotary bolt weapon. Each of the barrels fires two mass reactive shells the size of human heads. Because of this two shot mechanism and the insane speeds at which the barrels rotate, the Vulcan Mega Bolter has a fire rate of about 300 rounds per second. To keep this thing firing, one of the Titan's crew members uses what is known as a mag crane in the Titan's arm to feed enormous chains of shells into the weapon. This is done at all times while a second crew member recites the litany of reloading and redemption to keep the machine spirits of the gun appeased and hungry for more ammo. Like with all bolt weapons, the shells fired explode shortly after making contact, allowing this thing to carve a bloody path through the Titan's enemies, hundreds if not thousands of enemy infantry being cut down every second under the fury of the bolter. And just for reference, this is a gun that is primarily considered a scout Titan weapon, meaning that it is normally wielded by warhounds and smaller Titans, as their larger siblings wield weapons of far more destructive potential. Speaking of which, let's talk about the Volcano Cannon. So quite simply, the Volcano Cannon is a massive long range laser weapon that gets its name from the fact that the bursts of energy it releases are powerful enough to liquefy stone, creating an explosion of magma at the impact site. If targeting a fortress made of rockcrete, this weapon is apocalyptically powerful and makes for the perfect armament for warlord class titans that have been specifically tailored to hunt down super heavy tanks and other war engines. The laser produced by the Volcano Cannon is powerful enough to rip the heart from an enemy titan, or even bring about the incinerating apocalypse of a hive city. The Volcano Cannon uses so much energy that if it's mounted to anything other than a titan, such as one of the super heavy tanks known as a Shadow Sword, then after firing it, the tank will be completely immobilized, as it will need to spend time regenerating that lost energy. So let's move on to another crazy weapon known as the Vortex Missile Launcher. So the missiles fired by this thing literally create a warp vortex at the impact site, which is basically a controlled black hole that sucks everything in its vicinity directly into the warp. And I know that sounds pretty horrifying, but it gets a lot worse. So sometimes the vortex can actually drift around the battlefield, wreaking havoc on everything in its path. Anything small enough to be consumed by the vortex will be killed instantly, or be sent careening through hell for a thousand years. If a target is too large to be sucked in, like with that of a super heavy tank, then the vortex will still rip loose massive chunks from the machine, disabling it and removing it as a threat. And finally, let's talk about the Quake Cannon because this thing is kind of ridiculous. So the Quake Cannon is an extremely large piece of artillery said to be bigger and more powerful than any artillery weapon ever developed by the Imperium. These weapons are not exclusively used by the Titans as they are often the main armament on super heavy tanks such as the Bane Sword. And the Quake Cannon is definitely a fortress killer. If the building isn't completely leveled by the first shot, a massive web of cracks will spread out from the impact site, eventually collapsing the building and killing everything inside. And if I'm being honest, the Quake Cannon is one of the most grimdark weapons I have ever read about. You see, the shells that it fires each contain a fragment from a planet that has been destroyed by the full fury of Imperium Exterminatus. And when a planet is destroyed in such a way, the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus are deployed to receive fragments from the shattered world. This comes in the form of residual blast waves that the Mechanicum captures using arcane wave recorders. They bring this back to the Forge Worlds and the energy is used in the creation of the Quake Shells. Each of these shells is wholly unique and has its name recorded, most often sharing a name with the world that was destroyed and whose macrob essence permeates throughout it. The sound the shell makes when it's fired through the air is absolutely chilling, not just for the incoming destruction that the sound represents, but there's something far more ghoulish about it. Infantry that have witnessed the firing of such a gun claim they can hear the screams of those that were slain during the world's death, 
The wailing moans of millions of ghosts are sent careening into the enemies of their destroyers. Now, whether or not this is actually true or just guardsmen superstition remains unclear, but the belief still permeates throughout the Imperium. So what is the Collegia Titanica and how are Titans organized? So the Collegia Titanica is an ancient military division of the Mechanicum, and it oversees the operations of all of the Loyalist Titan legions. Now, they're often referred to as Adeptus Titanicus or Legio Titanicus, although these names are not entirely accurate. You see, every legion is represented by a forge world, whereas the Collegia Titanica acts as a governing force for all of them. They have the power to dictate when and where the various Titan legions will march to war, and what war zones they will commit their forces to. Having control over a single Titan is an immense amount of power, but controlling an entire legion, or like in the Collegia's case, all of them, is practically unthinkable. The Collegia Titanica is by far the most powerful organization within the Mechanicum, and possibly one of the most powerful organizations in the entire Imperium. And when it comes to the chain of command, you can think of it like this. All of the Forge Worlds are owned by the Mechanicum, and thus a Titan Legion created by a Forge World owes allegiance to the Mechanicum, which uses the Collegia Titanica to enforce its ideals on all of these legions. The Collegia also serves as record keepers, as they catalog all of the heroic deeds the Titans have ever done and every battle they have ever been a part of, diligently keeping track of the entire history of the Titan legions. The Titan legions are afforded a certain degree of independence as they're allowed to govern themselves as they see fit and have their own internal hierarchies. But at the end of the day, the high-tech priests of Mars have ultimate authority over them. This means that in order for a Titan Legion to send backup to other Imperial forces, the Imperium must make a formal request to the Tech Priests of Mars, who then must make a request to the Lords of a Legion's Forge World, who then pass that request on to the Ruler of the Legion. The Imperium can't make any demands of a Titan Legion directly, and at the end of the day, the Titan Legions will only adhere to this chain of command, as it is strictly enforced by the Collegia Titanica. Now, all of the different Titan legions are given a certain amount of freedom to conduct themselves in any way they see fit. Each of them will choose to uphold different decorations, colors, heraldry, and different philosophies of war. In battle, a Titan order will only take commands from a commanding princep or a higher ranking magos of the Mechanicum. They don't really give a shit how esteemed a general of the Astra Militarum or a Space Marine captain is. They just don't take orders from them. Now there is one exception to this, and that is if an Inquisitor shows up, as their rank technically supersedes everything else in the Imperium, with the exception of the God Emperor. And thus, if the Inquisitor deems it necessary, the Titan Legion will have to follow their orders. Now, this is a pretty delicate situation to say the least, and only the most idiotic Inquisitor would start trying to make pointless demands of a Titan Legion, as it could have some serious political ramifications, not just because of the audacity of such an order, but even more so, the fact that the Mechanicum worships these god engines. To try to forcefully take command of them is not only blasphemous, but a severe insult. So let's talk a little bit more about the Collegia itself. It's split into four major divisions, Militaris, Mondati, Investigatus, and Telepathica. Divisio Militaris operates as the main military branch, having Titans stationed on many worlds throughout the Imperium and especially the surrounding planets near the Eye of Terror. Mundati is the exploratory branch, whose fleets are made up of holy temple spacecrafts that seek to spread the Imperium's message to new worlds. The Imperium has been folding new planets into their ranks for thousands of years, so they're very good at convincing new worlds to join them, especially when you show up on a backwater world with multiple god engines. Locals tend to agree pretty quickly in that situation, and if for some reason they don't, then they have to deal with a whole bunch of angry titans. Now, the Divisio Investigatus is all about research and development, their main job is to construct new titans and engineer improvements in their technology based on the new STCs the Mechanicum has acquired. Although combat is not really the purpose of this division, that doesn't mean that they'll sit out of a fight entirely, as the battlefield makes for the perfect testing grounds for new weapon systems. And finally, we have Divisio Telepathica, and it's probably the most secretive and mysterious of all of the Collegia's divisions. They are solely responsible for the operation of what is known as a Psy Titan which are exclusively controlled by a Titan order known as Ordo Sinister. Now there's only one known pattern of Psy Titan, and that's the Warlord Sinister class. And to say the Psy Titans are absolutely horrifying is a massive understatement. You see, they have within them a bunch of human psychers that are surgically wired into the God Engine against their will. The pilot of such a Titan is what is known as a Null or a Blank. 
an individual who projects an aura that cuts psychers off from the warp. In this way, the pilot is able to limit or enhance the psychic abilities of the chained slaves. These things don't even use normal guns, as they use an ancient device to forcibly suck out the raw psychic energy and life force of the bound slaves. And I'm pretty bad with pronunciation, but I'm gonna do my best to say the name of this device. The Syracrux Anima. Anyways, this thing then funnels and projects the distilled suffering of all of the psychers to unleash waves of fear or psychokinetic abilities against the enemy. A Psy Titan can pulse out massive waves of psychically induced dread or suck the life force from thousands of enemy combatants. I can't stress enough just how ludicrously powerful these things are. A single trained psyker by all accounts is a god on the battlefield, bringing down pillars of fire to decimate their enemies or unleashing waves of debilitating mental energy that exhausts and confuses, making their foes easy targets for the bolter rounds of their comrades. But the psychic arts are a delicate thing. A psyker must learn to control the flow of energy through them much like a fire hose. If you leave it open all the way, it's difficult to control, and you not only will quickly deplete all of your energy, but death is a likely outcome. Not just for the psyker, but for everything around them. There are no limits put in place on the damned souls chained inside of a Psy Titan, meaning you can create and manipulate psychic phenomena on a truly massive scale. They are capable of utilizing similar psychic abilities to that of their infantry counterparts, just cranked up well past 11. Or even more horrifyingly, channeling that energy through a weapon on their left arm. And again, bad with names here, but the Sinistramus Tenebra. And this thing is more like a bastardized warp drive from a spaceship than an actual gun. As this nightmare weapon unleashes so much energy that it literally tears a hole in reality. The massive black sphere generated at the impact site tears everything apart, molecule by molecule, and sends it screaming into the warp. Just about everything about the Psy Titans is absolutely horrifying. But I'm not gonna lie, I think they're kinda awesome. And the main goal of these things is to combat the forces of chaos, wherever they may appear thus serving a similar role to that of the Grey Knights, although it is said that even less is known about Divisio Telepathica than even the Sigilites Legion themselves. By the time of the 41st millennium, there are hundreds of different Titan Legions, but let's examine the very first three, known by the Collegia Titanica as the Triad Ferrum Morgulis. These include Legio Mortis, Legio Ignatum, and Legio Tempestus, and these were the very first of the Titan Orders. And since this video has mostly focused on the Loyalist Titans, let's kick it off with one of the Traitor Legions. On the surface of Mars, Legio Mortis was known as the Martian Fabricator General's Executioners, crushing and destroying anything who would deviate from his plans. Now before the Martian Civil War would kick off, the bulk of Legio Mortis' god engines would ironically be assigned to the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, that of Horus and the Luna Wolves. Under the directive of the War Master, they would lay waste to hundreds of worlds and bring death to any that would deny Horus Lupercal's will. Legio Mortis was said to be particularly brutal, and even before the heresy, they had some pretty grimdark elements. It was said that they would religiously keep kill counts and lists of every life that they had ended. Many of their god engines would even have choirs of servitors whose sole purpose was to sing and chant these names as the god engine unleashed even more annihilation during battle. How the Emperor of Mankind didn't see betrayal coming from a Titan Legion that kept a band of lobotomized indentured servants to sing the names of their victims, we will never know. And perhaps it was because of the close bond between Mortis and the Luna Wolves that the seeds of heresy would grow to fruition within them first. They became so deadened to the constant brutality that they waged that eventually, perhaps by the mountains of rotting corpses they left in their wake, or by some other duplicitous means, the influence of the Chaos God Nurgle would slowly seep into the Legion, manifesting itself within the hearts of the Mortis Princeps. The blessings of Nurgle strengthened their fortitude to obscene levels and would allow them to withstand insane levels of punishing retaliation. The Legion had always been one of morbidity. They would often adorn their Titans with ghoulish and Baroque trophies. Now, these included the severed heads of other Titans and the desecrated banners of their households. They would be hung from the surface of the God Engines from massive chains and hooks. Furthermore, the human enemies they fought would often be taken as prisoners, and as punishment, would be hung and crucified on the Titans as well, forced to stay alive and watch as the God Engines they were nailed to brought further carnage on their comrades. Now, thankfully, anyone who was subjected to such a punishment probably wouldn't last too long, as the fires of war would inevitably consume them. However, their bodies and skeletal remains were left to hang and rot on the surface of the Titan. 
making their god engines resemble giant walking morgues. Now these trophies served as a warning to all that would stand in the way of Legio Mortis. It was said that their titans would relentlessly pursue their targets all the way to the galactic rim if necessary. Their god engines would march from one battle to another without stopping. They were the definition of relentless efficiency. Now, Legio Ignatum was far different and were famous for their unshakable loyalty. The god engines of Legio Ignatum stood in stubborn defiance of all that would threaten the security of Mars and the Imperium of Man. Their titans were said to have never fallen back, no matter the odds, and would never turn their backs on the enemy. And whereas their sibling legions, Mortis and Tempestus, were by all accounts avatars of death and destruction primarily, conquerors before anything else, Legio Ignatum stood as a bulwark, a protector of the weak, having said to come to the defense of many Martian cities that were besieged by monsters and traitors. And these were assignments that other legions would have scoffed at, as they were gods of destruction, not a shield to be used by those too weak to defend themselves. Ignatum, however, felt completely differently, and their chivalry would lead many of the Martian forge cities to pledge loyalty to them, as Ignatum had proven itself to be great and mighty protectors. Now, the princeps of Ignatums were known for being cool-headed and diplomatic. However, when the enemy would step foot upon the ground in which they swore to defend, their righteous anger would come blaring to the surface, and they would unleash the full extent of their wrath and devastation upon the trespassers. Ironically, this is where they got the nickname the Fire Wasps from, as much like a hive of wasps, the most surefire way to piss them off is to poke at their hive. Their part to play in the Grand Crusade was defensive in nature, whereas Legio Mortis was assigned to be outright conquerors and destroyers of anything and anyone that would resist the Imperium's efforts. The Stormlords of Legio Tempestus would attach to many of the exploratory fleets to chart uncharted territory. Ignatum, however, would remain as sentinels for territory claimed by the Mechanicum and the Imperium. They were the shield, while Tempestus and Mortis were the spear. Ignatum Titans would rarely leave the solar system, and it was said that no harm would come to anything under their protection. The princeps of the Legion believed that defeat only took the form of failing to uphold the oaths that they had sworn. There was a battle near the end of the Ulanor campaign, where 12 Ignatum Titans stood in defiance of hundreds of Orc Gargants that were attempting to lay siege to the world, and a Gargant is basically the equivalent of a Titan for the Orcs. Except for way more shoddily constructed, but since they're cheap to make and are basically just a giant mountain of garbage, the Orcs can make a lot of them, and they are incredibly dangerous. However, the 12 Princeps managed to hold off the invaders for four days, and even once the majority of the population had escaped, they still refused to retreat, stubbornly facing down the Orc menace until every one of the Titans had fallen. The 12 princeps that gave their lives during this war would forever be immortalized and would solidify the Legion's reputation as defenders of mankind. Now, given these guys' reputation, it should come as no surprise that when the Horus Heresy finally started, they would side with Mars and the Emperor and refuse to turn traitor. Now, during the Martian Civil War, Legio Mortis would mistakenly confuse Ignatum's ideals as a weakness and as an opportunity to strike, only to be laid low by their god engines. If it had not been for the Fire Wasps, it's very possible that Legio Mortis would have been successful in conquering the Red Planet. Now, it's also important to understand that the three Titan Orders of the Triad Ferrum Margulum were not the only Titan Legions stationed on Mars. In fact, there were dozens of smaller Titan Legions as well. And unfortunately for the Fire Wasps, the forces of the traitors would eventually overwhelm them, and all of the Titans they had stationed on Mars would inevitably be destroyed but not without taking an enormous amount of their enemies with them. However, the Legion would live on, as it had Titans stationed on many other worlds and wasn't completely wiped out. To this day, Legio Ignatum is the only Titan Legion to have ever been allowed to set foot upon Holy Terra itself, and they were instrumental in its protection during the Warmaster's siege. And much farther in the future, when the current Warmaster of Chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, would set his sights on Cadia, the remaining god engines of Ignatum would stand firm in defense of the Cadian Gate. And finally, let's talk about Legio Tempestus. Now, when it comes to terms of loyalty and betrayal, things are not always as black and white as we would like them to be. And unlike with the previous two Titan Orders who overwhelmingly chose one side over the other, Legio Tempestus was different in that it actually had a schism of its own. Half of the Legion remained loyal to Mars, while the other sided with the War Master. The territory that the Tempestus Legion had carved out for itself shared a border with that of Legio Mortis, and crossing that line was a declaration of war, 
one that over thousands of years of their history, both sides would cross on multiple occasions, coming to blows over rights to hidden caches of archaeotech buried deep beneath the red sands of Mars. The three Titan orders were united, however, that wouldn't prevent them from petty squabbling and small-scale engagements that would see both sides sent back to lick their wounds. Now eventually, rivalry between Mortis and Tempestus would blossom into loathing for one another and would set the stage for future events. Like with many of the records of the Titan legions before the Grand Crusade, little is known about this period of anarchy. When the Titan legions would join in the Imperium's Grand Crusade, Legio Tempestus would have its god engines divided up and sent to accompany many of the different fleets. The largest force would join on the 12th Expeditionary Fleet helmed by the Ultramarine's Primarch Rebute Gilliman. This was known as the Long Road to Ultramar, and on it, Legio Tempestus would be instrumental in hundreds of the Ultramarine's campaigns and would assist them into folding many worlds back into the Imperium. The princeps of these titans were said to be braver than any other, as they would willingly be sent into battlefields so dangerous that even in the pilot seat of a titan, it was considered a suicide mission. Despite the odds, the Tempestus Legion would prove to be instrumental in turning the tides against the enemies of mankind. Now, the titans of Legio Tempestus would earn the nickname the Storm Lords due to their mastery of planetary assault, striking like lightning, their titans descending from the sky in massive god engine sized drop pods. Like fallen gods, the worlds they would seek to conquer would tremble beneath the massive quakes generated by their descent. And the combination of massive burners from their drop pods and the macro ordnance they brought to war were said to burn the skies themselves, igniting the atmosphere of the worlds they were sent to conquer, causing massive destructive storms, some of which would last for generations. Due to their seemingly reckless pursuit of battle, there would come a point where half of the titans within the Legion would have to return to Mars for repair. Leadership would then pass to another princep and the Titan Legion would be divided once again. Half of the Legion would return to Mars, while the other half stayed with the expeditionary fleets, switching back and forth between the different fleets as necessary. Those that would remain with the War Master's fleets would inevitably side with him in the coming Civil War, while those who returned to Mars would remain faithful to the Red Planet and would fight valiantly against their hated rivals Legio Mortis during this time. However, these Loyalists would meet a similar fate to that of Legio Ignatum, in that most of the Loyalist God Engines would be destroyed. However, there were some survivors, and now in the 41st millennium, those that remained loyal control a new Forge world known as Orestus. To get to the bottom of the Titan's history, we have to begin with Mars. And long before the Imperium of Man had even formed yet, Mars and Terra maintained separate empires. They had different goals and ambitions, but would trade with each other regularly and considered each other close allies. However, with the coming of the Age of Strife, massive warp storms made communication and travel between the two worlds next to impossible. Terra would see itself descend into an age of techno-barbarism, where long-held systems of government and powerful nations crumbled against the will of bloodthirsty and feral warlords. The situation on Mars was different, but by all accounts just as bad. As long ago, the planet had undergone a period of terraforming. At this point, the process was still incomplete. However, large sections of Mars were said to resemble the beautiful paradise of old Earth, with trees and streams and all manner of beautiful nature standing alongside technological achievement. Unfortunately, the progress Mars had made with its terraforming would swiftly be eroded by civil war. You see, without a steady supply line from Terra, eventually its atmospheric radiation shields and oxygen generators would inevitably fail. And once again, the radiation of the solar system's sun burned away all of the work that had been done. Mars became the barren red world that it once was so long ago. Now faced with an existential crisis, the Martians would adopt a new faith known as the Colt Mechanicum, where the technology and machines that allowed for their continued existence were seen as sacred. However, not all of Mars was fully united and the red planet would see an age of civil war and strife known to the Martians as the era of pathogenesis. It was during this time that the very first god engines took their first steps on Mars. The history of the Titans is incredibly obscure, important documents having either been lost or sealed away long ago. However, the prevailing knowledge states that they were originally created to assist the fledgling Mechanicum during an early Martian war against a heretical force known as the Psi Carnivora. This cast of cannibalistic heretics managed to seize control of large swaths of the Red Planet, and if it had not been for the creation of the three original Titan Orders, Mars very well could have fallen, and their descendants, the various Titan legions that would follow in their footsteps, would be based upon their divine template. 
Little is known about the Kai Carnivora, but it is said that they created many of their own monstrous and blasphemous engines of war, and that the only thing that even stood a chance against these heretical machines were the Mechanicum's newfound titans. At this point, there was basically nothing that could stand against the awe-inspiring might of a god engine. They were nearly indestructible and were bristling with weapons of incomprehensible destructive potential. It was an impossible task to stand before the overwhelming might of a god engine, but the idea of standing against an entire legion of them, one of which that could have several hundred of these sacred war machines at any given time, was an unthinkable impossibility. After the Kai Carnivora had been eradicated and the Red Planet was stained with their blood, the Titan Orders marched against the surface of Mars to forever keep its mighty forges defended. Though the Titan Orders were a creation of the Mechanicum, over the years, they would become less and less reliant upon them and would eventually take up identities of their own. Each of the orders taking on unique characteristics and describing to different philosophies and codes of warfare. Eventually, the Titan orders would become the Titan Legios by the auspices of the Collegia Titanica. And these three legions, along with all of the newcomers that would be formed later in their footsteps, would take on their own name as well as icons and banners that mark their unique histories and cultures. In the 30th millennia after the Age of Strife had finally passed and the warp storms disintegrated, the Emperor of Mankind and the newfound ruler of Terra would eventually come to Mars. Inevitably, the Titan Legions would join with the Emperor in his Great Crusade, where their earth-sundering weaponry and metric tons of impenetrable armor would lay low multitudes of resistant empires, the foolish worlds that would deny the Imperium's greatness and would choose to reject the Imperium's offer of unity were quickly and brutally shown the error of their ways, as the wrath of hundreds of god engines leveled cities and shook worlds. Through the efforts of the Grand Crusade, many other forge worlds would be united with the mother planet of Mars, and thus they would discover the fledgling seeds of new Titan orders. They would in turn be folded into the Collegia Titanica, and though on the surface, all of these different Titan legions would at least in theory be ruled over by Mars, they were masters of their own destiny. And despite their shared history, some of these orders that had developed completely independent of the Red Planet's influence would grow to resent what they saw as the false master with unearned authority. And with this, the embers of resentment would eventually ignite into full-blown rebellion during the Horus Heresy and the Great Martian Civil War. So in order to better understand the Titan Legion's role in the Horus Heresy, we need to have an understanding of what the Dark Mechanicum was and why they chose to side with the War Master. Now, before signing the Treaty of Mars, the Martian tech priests were united. That's not to say that they all collectively agreed with one another on every issue, as with any nation. This is definitely not the case. But there was peace, and even before the Emperor arrived on Mars, the Martians had already started a crusade of their own, heading out into the stars to establish new forge worlds and expand their territory. They did this by making blind jumps into the warp, and needless to say, many of their ships would be destroyed by this or at the very least they were never heard from again. But many of them would find new worlds to colonize and would turn them into forge worlds, planet-sized factories where industry was the one true religion. Now, just like with the hive colonies that were sent out from Terra, all of these new worlds that had been established would be cut off from their home planet during the Age of Strife. And this is a period that would last for thousands of years. When the Age of Strife finally ended, the Emperor of Mankind would journey to the Red Planet. When he arrived, he appeared like some form of glorious golden god, and thus, having been deeply entrenched in the religion of the cult Mechanicum for thousands of years, the Martians determined that he must be the living avatar of the machine god, of the Omnissiah, as their religious doctrines had prophesied such a being appearing before them at some point in the future. He told the Martians of a time long ago when the two planets were united, and how he wished to see that rematerialize. The treaty would see Mars and the Mechanicum join in the Emperor's new Imperium. He would allow them to still govern as they saw fit, and despite the Emperor's disdain for religion, he would for the most part turn a blind eye to their worship of the Machine God, and made no claims that he wasn't this avatar of the Omnissiah like they believed he was. In addition, the Emperor would provide for them several navigator households with which to guide their ships through the Immaterium. This would end the Martian practice of blindly jumping through the warp and would allow them to reunite with the Forge Worlds that they had established so long ago. In return, Mars would provide the Imperium with supplies, starships, and weapons with which they could utilize during the Great Crusade, the goal of which was to reunite all of the human worlds once again under the same banner. Now, it's very possible that the Martians realized the same thing that the Emperor had, in that a war with Terra would have taken thousands of years to achieve victory, if such a thing was even possible and that there was much more to gain from an alliance than a declaration of war. 
Thus, the treaty was signed upon the summit of Olympus Mons, and Mars and Terra were united once again. Fun fact, this is why the symbol of the Imperium, the Imperial Aquila, actually has two heads. One represents Terra, and the other represents Mars. Now, all that being said, not all of the Martians saw this treaty as adequate as it had many stipulations that a lot of them saw as massive overstepping of boundaries and an outright censorship of their pursuit of technological advancement. Much of the knowledge that was already possessed by Mars had come to be known as Hera Technica, heretical technology that was a blasphemy to the Emperor and all of mankind. These included, but were not limited to, concepts like fusing technology with warp-born sorcery, studying too deeply into the nature of the immaterium, the manipulation of human gene code, and most importantly of all, the construction of AI. The Emperor knew all too well the inevitable destructive potential of machines that could think for themselves, as he had witnessed firsthand the uprising of the Men of Iron during the Cybernetic Revolt, a dark period that almost saw humanity completely wiped out. And this is me just thinking out loud here, but it's rumored that in order to create the Primarchs, the Emperor had to make a deal with the Chaos Gods. So despite the fact that it was something that he had engaged in himself, he didn't trust the Martians to follow in a similar path and avoid corruption like he had. Thus the banning of delving into the warp and messing with human gene code. Now a lot of this stuff had already been thoroughly researched by the Martians, and they had created many machines utilizing that technology. However, it was all suddenly being deemed heretical. The Emperor ordered the Fabricator General of Mars to seal away all of the research and any existing machines that utilized it in massive vaults known as the Vaults of Morvac. Only the Emperor himself, or a trusted representative, would have access to this cache of dark technology. The group of Martians that viewed this treaty as heretical would eventually be known as the Dark Mechanicum. They believed that the Emperor had massively overstepped his bounds and shackled their pursuit of knowledge, dooming the Martian people to an age of ignorance. They did not view him as the avatar of the Omnissiah, just as a tyrant who would force the Martians into subservience. And even though it wasn't said out loud, he was doing this with a veiled threat to unleash his legions of transhuman super soldiers upon their world if they didn't meet his demands. The members of the Dark Mechanicum would refuse to stray from their path. They would not forsake any pursuit of knowledge no matter the dangers it posed. This same line of logic would spread to all of the Forge Worlds that the Mechanicum reclaimed. And there, in secret cults of like-minded magi, would delve deeper and deeper into heretical technologies, hidden from sight, their heresy beginning to fester and spread, the hatred for the Imperium simmering just beneath the surface, much like their blasphemous war engines and alchemical monstrosities that they kept hidden from sight. Now, sometime later, Warmaster Horus would send envoys to many of these worlds to meet with high-ranking members of this secret Mechanicum. He would sympathize with their plight and would present himself as an ally to the pursuit of knowledge. When asked to join him in his rebellion, many of these magi were suspicious as once before, Another glorious stranger had come to them with a similar offer. Horus promised them that he was completely different from his father, and offered them complete independence. He told them that they could keep all of their forge worlds, and that as the leader of the new Imperium, he would be emperor in name alone, and that the Mechanicum would be allowed to grow its empire as it saw fit. No restraints, no restrictions. And most importantly, he would break the shackles that the Emperor had placed on them. The only thing that Horus asked for in return was a steady supply of new armaments and war engines with which he could wage war against his father. He asked that when the time came, they would stand with him against the Imperium. The members of the Dark Mechanicum agreed, and thus many of the far-flung Forge Worlds that had since become disillusioned with their Martian overlords joined with the War Master. The situation on Mars was no different, where half of the Martians would inevitably end up turning against the Empire and joining with Horus in secret. Their heretical ideas of independence and rebellion would inevitably spread to the Titan legions as well, who were sympathetic to the Dark Mechanicum's claims. These newfound Dark Alliances would lead to the Martian Schism, the greatest civil war the Red Planet had ever seen. Over the course of the Horus Heresy, the Titan legions would participate in hundreds of devastating battles, where god engines were turned against one another. These events left the legions crippled beyond repair, or in some cases, ultimately pushed into extinction. The names of the Holy War Machines and their legendary pilots confined to the halls of history. Despite the Titan Legions being a fraction of the strength they once held, the Age of Titans is far from over. The God Engines still march to war in the 41st millennium. However, it's important to note that the Titan Legions that still exist are in a fractious state, 
and are nowhere near as mighty as the time in which they controlled hundreds of god engines. More than any other creation of mankind, the loss of a single titan is a blow like no other, each being impossibly ancient and having served as the liberator or reaper of a thousand worlds. Every remaining titan is an ancient relic of an age long ago, obscured by time by those who would prefer to leave the events of the heresy a secret. The age of knowledge is dead, a cold and corrupted memory. The death of innocence has come, and the new age of ignorance is upon us. Mortal bodies wither and mortal minds fade, yet the animus machina is immortal, and the god engines endure all.